Hey, Folkland, before we start today's show, I want to remind you about the ultimate DFS pass. Look, if you were in there last week and you would have gotten our fade article, which would have said, hey, fade DeMarco Murray, fade Joe Mixon, fade Des Bryant for this DFS season. And on top of that, our man Ben Cummins, who's all up in there, he said, Rogers Cobb stack, Gurley's Ram D stack, you got to have these in your lineups. All kinds of reports in the ultimate DFS pass. Pass, so go check it out right now, ultimatedfspass.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from the Play Draft Studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. I'm not okay. <laughs> well, that's a strong start. Hey, oh, welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. But I'll be okay. I'm not okay, but I'll be okay. Hey. Welcome into the show. Just breaking as we were basically starting the show. Reports that David Johnson will officially have wrist surgery and is expected to miss two to three months. So that's eight to 12 weeks. Well, there's one of those first round picks that is a no a bust. And uh, look, this is not good news if you own David Johnson, but we say it every year, you don't win your league at the draft. And so today's show is perfect because it's all about uh, waiver wire and basically trying to move on, trying to find another solution, trying to find your way out of this mess because it is a mess. If you, if you drafted David Johnson, you invested your first pick and you didn't draft again until maybe pick 20 or 24, um, or 21 and 25, and now you have to adjust, and you're not going to be the only one. No, you're not, and and I promise you, because we have seen it every single year without a doubt, I promise you, there will be plenty of teams that drafted David Johnson with the one-on-one that win the championship this year. This is not a death sentence that says, now you can't win. Other people will lose studs. It's how you recover. My dad was asking me, because he doesn't really – uh, play fantasy he's like what so what do you do when like you know david johnson goes down and and i was like well that you know you that's kind of step one you cry <laughs> step one you mourn yes step two you get over it no you you know it's about the waiver wire pickups and the trades and the values and making the right start sits those things are are going to get you through it and we're here to help. well i mean what the stages of grief are denial we I already had, did I that had plenty of that anger oh yeah i had plenty of that then bargaining that's trades. Let's go get some trades done. Let's find. Is that really the third step? Yeah. Or, uh, uh, yeah, it's bargaining and then depression and then acceptance. So after the trade, you've got to be depressed. Uh, well, sure. When you get Bilal Powell as your replacement like I did yesterday. Don't tilt you go trade. To you go no. to that leads us to the next point. <laughs> yes. Do not <laughs> tilt trade. Here's the deal. Put, um, put the computer down. Take a moment. Wait till your emotions are under control. Do some yoga. The worst time for this kind of an injury to hit is week one because of overreaction and because of the fact we don't have a long record of performance from players that exploded, whether it's Tariq Cohen or the player that everybody asked me about last night, Benny Fowler, who everyone said, okay, it's time to grab him. How much fab do you spend on him? Is he a solid wide receiver too? Oh, tell your friends to spend it all. Uh, oh, and who so I said the, $0 is what I'll spend on Benny Fowler. His oh, Greg Ogle. Greg Ogletree. Ogletree, yeah. There you go. That's an Ogletree factor. So week one's the easiest time to overreact. It's the easiest time to make a mistake. And you basically, you're in this situation where you do not want to overreact or underreact. We'll talk about Tariq Cohen on the show today. We'll talk about Javorius Allen, and we'll talk about some of the other waiver wire options. Our streams of the week are on the show today in terms of the quarterback position, players that you can sign off the waiver wire and start in week two. So we each have made our pick in that regard, and we're going to touch right now on uh, Monday Night Football and the quick question, which is basically, look, what are the takeaways from the Monday Night Football games? We had two of them. We had Minnesota and New Orleans, and then we had Denver and we had uh, Los Chargers. Angeles. Yeah. So takeaways from Monday Night's game, guys, where do you begin? My first thought uh, is, you know, with the Saints and the Vikings game, and I, it's that the Vikings defense is as good as they were last year. You're, you know, one of the things I'm looking for week one is just, 
are these defenses that were good still good are the defenses that were bad still bad I'm I'm on the fence about the Saints I came in this morning and I joked with Mike I was like oh how about that New Orleans yeah. Saints defense they did look different especially in the beginning of the game they they were hitting harder they were swarming they were doing good things that they didn't necessarily do last year but they spent the entire game on the field and so they they certainly wore down but I am confident that the Minnesota Vikings defense they they look great and the Minnesota offensive line looked not horrific, which is what we were hoping this offseason. So are you, it, just to piggyback on Minnesota's defense real quick, Pittsburgh? No, I, I don't. On the road? No. Are I'm you not. that confident in Minnesota being I, good? I, I think Minnesota at that point will be like a very low-end play. I'll be willing to play them All if, right. you know, they're my 12th pick or if I'm in a deeper league, but uh, they're they're not someone I'm looking to start that week. My, my uh, takeaway here. I'll go to the Saints side and Drew Brees on the road, still Drew Brees in it, and I don't know what was going on with the play calling for Sean Payton. With I know you got to be committed to the run, I get it, but it was just failing miserably, and they did not start airing it out. And then you had that the route where uh, Ted Ginn got the the end zone target but I think it was Fleener or someone had peeled off right in his in his path I mean it was it was a strange game where the Saints just their offense looked really bad they had yeah. a need well they had uh, a yeah need they did need one of the things that's difficult is you have two-thirds of this backfield in New Orleans that is brand new Adrian Peterson who had a limited amount of snaps Alvin Kamara and you wonder sometimes if a player like Peterson will require a workload that is unavailable to him in New Orleans to even be – Yes. Like like basically when they asked him to hit, evaluate his performance, he said there's not much to evaluate. And that's true. Like he technically – I think he led the team in yards per carry. But does it, it didn't even matter because you couldn't trust one guy. And he certainly wasn't going to catch the ball even though he did get an end zone or a red zone target – and you saw what Mike you just said—a discombobulated offense and Peterson a pretty does, good defense. He doesn't fit the scheme. I mean, this is what we were saying all offseason. It's it was the strangest pickup for New Orleans to go get Peterson because he is a guy who who gets stronger as the game goes along because he wears out a defense. He's not a great pass catcher. He has the itis. He's got that fumble itis frequently. I mean, just it See, was I, a very bizarre signing. For I think me. that I think that uh, you're. It, it's kind of half right. I think that the offense does not fit Adrian Peterson. He's not going to get 20-plus carries. But I think Peterson fits what the offense needs, which was a Timmy Hightower that can, when you get down at that one, you could give him the ball or come in and spell. I mean, he's basically seemingly playing that role that we saw last year. Right, you but, saw but the, Hightower knows he's the backup. Right, that's the problem. Adrian Peterson doesn't Adrian know that yet. Adrian on the sideline. What line. you saw with Peterson, and as opposed to Lacey, who I'm fine dropping, by the way. Yes. I'm not doing that with Peterson because you had the inverse Gillisley situation for Peterson this week. Peterson is look, if, if New Orleans was or if New England was down like New Orleans was down, you wouldn't have seen much of Gillisley. Peterson's gonna get goal line opportunities and he's gonna be the back that gets the ball a lot more when they're leading by a lot, and you didn't get to see those things yesterday. So I he is a hold. He is not a it's confident fair. start, but he is a hold. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention would have been, look, to this point about the Saints' defense, Sam Bradford absolutely carved them up in a – just some of these passes by Bradford were some of the best I've ever seen, stepping up into the pocket, repeatedly taking hits, and then Diggs and Thielen were absolutely perfect for this offense. And a lot of people say, look, Diggs, he moved from the slot to the outside – that was to unlock the potential of Stephon Diggs, and you saw him make contested catches in this game. I think Thielen went 9 for 157. Diggs was something like 7 for 93 and two touchdowns. Yes. They, they, this offense went – I was we were watching the game, and I'm like, oh, here comes the 1,000 paper cuts from the Minnesota Vikings because it was just dink and dunk. And then they went Genji's ultimate – Ooh, I like Andy, it. He pulled out the samurai sword, and they just went full ham and started hacking away. I mean, it was unbelievable performance. Pretty similar to Alex Sam Smith. Bradford. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, 
a little bit more, a little bit more downfield for Bradford th- than Smith. But yeah, I mean, it was they they baited him in with that short game, and then they just they had him on their heels, and they could not recover. The Saints defense. No rookie in Week One had a higher percentage of snaps than Dalvin Cook. He's Seven, good. Seventy three percent of the snaps, and came away from that game with a veteran, uh, disciplined coach like Mike Zimmer saying that his debut was fantastic. So he's the man. Latavius he's a full workhorse. Murray it was watching direct TV. I mean No, he, he came in and fumbled once. Cable, you mean. <laughs> yeah. Well he I'm the point is, is oh, he, he, was, he will be watching. He was watching. He was not playing. And Dalvin Cook owns the backfield. He owns the targets and he looked a hundred percent he he did things that Amir Abdullah cannot do. And I told this to Mike during yep. the game last night. He consistently broke leg tackles. He consistently did not go down on the first impact, and he looked like a professional running back. That's all you can say right now as an endorsement. Yeah, and it's seventy three percent of snaps. It's only week one. However, I mean, he looks fantastic. And one of the things I talk about on the show is like journaling. I mean, you got to write down notes, right? Sure. Because it's easy to forget what has happened. So write this down. If a player is dominant in college and they're passing your eye test, and they look great in college, and they come in and they bomb the combine, don't, don't care. Don't, don't, don't just freak out and completely bail on a player, and especially when their draft stock was still very high, a third-round pick. And I'll throw a caveat in there, though. I would say that dominance in college needs to be from a conference of worth. That's fair. As opposed to a middle-tier conference situation. But – Dalvin Cook did it in college. He dominated both in the passing and the in the rushing game. Had- Any, uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say it looked like we were about to move on. We haven't touched the uh, – there were two Monday night games. Yes. Uh, anything from the Broncos Chargers? That was some of the worst play calling I've ever seen from the Chargers. I mean, now, you're was- a little bit biased. N- no. Why don't, you explain uh, okay, to the, sure. uh, why don't you explain to the listeners what happened to you last night? I needed one reception for six yards from Hunter Henry. <laughs> a lot of people did. To win, to win my matchup. And the only reason I needed that was because that last Dalvin Cook carry where everyone on the field knew they were going to run, and he bounced it to the outside and ripped off like a 30-yard carry. Uh, so Hunter Henry obviously did not get his reception. But it's, it's not just that. It was, I mean, it was not creative. It was... Run, run, pass, punt from the Chargers. And then they finally changed it up in the second half. And, you know, then they started having some success. Uh, it just was – and then the, the two-minute the, the, the two drill at the end of the game yeah, was, was an abomination. I tweeted out of my said, Andy Reid thinks that they're doing a bad job at this. And so don't want to just stay super, super negative about it. What I thought, uh, which goes to kind of what you're saying, the play calling and, and all that, uh, the reason I liked Melvin Gordon was Anthony Lynn. He's a running back, then he's a running back coach, then he's an offensive coordinator that runs the ball more than anybody. Now he's a head coach. He's clearly going to run the ball. This is what he wants to do. Phillip Rivers didn't start passing until they were down two touchdowns with you know 10 minutes left and there was just no other choice. So in a normal game against an easier defense, because the Broncos are – Hashtag elite. Yeah. He, they're going to be running like crazy. Yeah. Is there any Broncos takeaways? Oh, no. Nope. Well, <laughs> I, I just hit that. When I hit that button, Mike, you jumped. Yeah, because I was trying to talk and it freaked I, me out. I thought we were done. I apologize. Broncos, Broncos takeaways, man. I thought CJ Anderson looked good. I yes. would much rather have him than Jamal Charles, just based on what I saw, especially with how the carries broke down the first half and the first, you know, maybe even three quarters of the game. That was my takeaway. <laughs> and don't sign Benny Fowler. No. That was incidental. No, that was – well, uh, yeah, I'll bring up Benny Fowler in a little bit. He, yeah, well, I, I will just say you got two elite cornerbacks there for the Chargers, and so your two main you know, targets in Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas, they were covered a whole lot better than Benny Fowler. Which is why I thought Hunter Henry was going to have an okay game, you, you turd. <laughs> Solid analysis. Brooks, do you think it's okay if I hit the news drop now? Go for it. News and notes from around the league. Let's start with the big one. David Johnson, wrist surgery, expected to miss two to three months. It seems like the Cardinals were essentially looking around to find somebody that said he didn't have to go on uh, IR, wouldn't have to go get surgery. 
Now, you're a fantasy owner. You have David Johnson. You're in a redraft league. If you have an IR spot, that's easy. You throw David Johnson on the IR spot. If you don't, you've got a tough decision to make because the earliest he could possibly be returned if he goes to IR is week 10 against the Seahawks. That would be the earliest possible return. But you have to ask yourself some questions for the Cardinals. One, do you rush him back if they're not in contention? So if Arizona isn't fighting for a playoff spot, now if they are, the reason to bring David Johnson back is clear. But if they're not, do they shelf him and just look to next year? And what do you do as a redraft owner? What would you advise? Because he could be a valuable playoff run player if for some reason he came back. But that's a you know short bench spots. Yeah, that if you only have five bench spots, that's going to be a really tough hold uh, in two to three months. Yeah, he could be back week 10. He could also not come back at all, and you could be hamstringing and playing. So what with, would you do, though? What would you do if you're in that situation? I would probably I, – I like what you're talking about, where it, if they're in contention, they're far more likely to bring him back and accelerate the, the pace of return. So hold on to him for a couple weeks, see if they start out 0-3, and then at that point reevaluate and possibly drop him. He is officially – Put on IR, and Jason Lockenfora is reporting the Cardinals intend to re-sign Chris Johnson. Oh, this and is so, good news before oh, the waiver wire. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so it's got it's it's good we had that. They signed DJ Foster off of the New England practice squad as a depth signing, but Kerwin Williams, Andre Ellington, and potentially Chris Johnson could form a very unfavorable RBBC on a suddenly bad-looking Arizona offense as David Johnson goes down. If that happens, I would assume that Chris Johnson would be the lead back in a <clears throat> not pretty situation. I'm not sure that you would want him, but he's he will be worth picking up because usually when you look at the waiver wires, you've got running backs that you couldn't possibly start in a pinch. I think Chris Johnson and or Kerwin Williams, if Chris Johnson He'll doesn't at least sign, touch the ball, will be a spot flex in a nightmare. A spot flex and a nightmare. <laughs> that is a good summary. Andrew Luck ruled out for week two against those Arizona Cardinals. Yeah. Pete Carroll said Thomas Rawls will play week two against the 49ers. I think we saw based on the splits in terms of the snap count carries, th Thomas Rawls will have every chance to be the workhorse for this offense. Do we agree? Would you uh, start him against San Francisco in week two? Not yes. A, not a work. Oh, I would start him, but not a workhorse because ProSice will still get the passing down work. And and Carson showed enough. I, I don't think anyone there will become a workhorse, but I would I would start Thomas Rawls because San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> nice. All right, Alfred Morris got the surprise start as the handcuff for Ezekiel Elliott. Darren McFadden was inactive. What do we make of that situation? A lot of people drafted McFadden. Yeah. Some because, look, Ezekiel Elliott looked like he would be suspended. He still could be. So if, if Zeke's injunction is overturned, all of a sudden Alfred Morris – is the starting running back? Not necessarily. Does that make him a potential waiver wire pickup this week? No. Not for me. In this, I know it looks weird, but teams do this sometimes where the actual, because they're saying Alfred Morris, he's our change of pace, which I guess the change of pace is they want to get, they want to slow things way down from, from Zeke. It's like, it's a it, real change. It's of the pace. change up. I said. All all preseason, Alfred Morris does not look slow. Alfred yeah. Morris looked I really fast to me. I can be on that Alfred Morris yes. island. It's a lonely island. I remember Alfred Morris doing this exact same thing last year, though. He looked much better in preseason. Then the time the regular season rolled around, he looked like he did on Sunday night. So just because Darren McFadden was inactive, that that doesn't mean he won't be the actual starting running back if, if Zeke is suspended. It was something I wanted to bring up because we didn't Absolutely. address it yesterday. Yeah, and I, I would still be focused much more on the Darren McFadden than the Alfred Morris side as a handcuff, although I would pretty much what this says now is I don't want either for now. But if Zeke Fair. goes down, if that happened, I think it would be McFadden. I mean, Alfred Morris, he, he had one yard on four carries and looked every bit that part. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Before we move on to the waivers, I want to thank SeatGeek for sponsoring today's show, for supporting this podcast. If you haven't heard of SeatGeek, if you don't have the SeatGeek app on your phone, you're making a mistake. I'm about to take my six-year-old and my parents to the wild card game 
for the Arizona Diamondbacks out here in Phoenix. That's presumptuous. Uh, that is correct. It is <laughs> presumptuous. Um, but SeatGeek, look, you know what it's like to buy tickets elsewhere. It's very complicated, but SeatGeek is the easy way to buy tickets. They make it super simple. You open the app up. You can see exactly a visual representation of the stadium you want to go to, and green means go. You see those better deals highlighted in dark green, and you can just scoop them up. It takes two seconds, and they are the absolute best ticket-buying experience. So the best thing is is our listeners, listeners of the Fantasy Footballers, you get $20 off your first ticket purchase. So the first time you go to a game, you're saving money. 20 bucks off your first purchase. All you have to do is download the SeatGeek app, enter the promo code FOOTBALLERS. That's the promo code FOOTBALLERS for $20 off your first Z geek purchase. Yeah, and listen, if you need a suit, there is only one place to go, that is Indochino and Not a lawsuit. No, not a lawsuit, a beautiful custom tailored fitted suit. We're not talking about one of these bunchy, nasty off the rack things that aren't made for you. We're talking about one of those like $1000 looking beautiful suits that fit you everywhere that you are because it's made to fit you. Uh, I've got one. All three of us have one. It's the best thing that I've ever fit in because it was tailored to my body. They make it really easy. They send you a little measuring tape and show you this little video. You send them your measurements and then you get a suit that is perfect. You got weddings coming up. You've got any events. So this week, our listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just 379 bucks at Indochino.com when you enter footballers at checkout. Not ballers, but footballers. That's 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit plus free shipping. It's Indochino.com, promo code footballers for any premium suit, just 379 and free shipping. You'll never have to worry about uh, bad-fitting suits again. Wasn't there a player that was tailored yesterday? Wasn't that one of your tailored, tailored off the map? Off the map. <laughs> yep, that made a whole you lot also, of sense. You also fixed a solution for Danny Woodhead. Hey, how many things have I screwed up so far today? We're uh, doing good. We're, there's still time. <laughs> there's still time. Wouldn't, we're doing well? Oh, no. <laughs> the irony. <laughs> Put me in, coach. I, I can't ever understand. I do We're not well. understand the doing good, doing well. No, you he don't. He did good. He did well. I just don't get it. I've like Googled it, and I've looked at it, and then it's immediately out of my brain. I do not understand the difference. It's definitely doing well. <laughs> but I don't, I, I don't get why. You don't inherently connect with that grammatical. Can I, we, I don't let's just inherently remove, connect with any grammatical. Let's remove one of those words from, the, from language. Okay. Okay. Makes it easier. Sure. I'm hey, that's fine with me. <laughs> All right. Week one waiver wire. We're going we're gonna to try to give you kind of a percentage of fab. I, I think that's a good way to go about it because your fab budget, if you're in a league with fab, which is free agent acquisition budget, you may have a hundred dollars to spend on the year. You may have two hundred. We'll try to give you a little bit of a percentage gauge for some of these players. If you're in a waiver priority system, we'll try to tell you whether we believe these players are worthwhile to kind of blow your waiver priority and grab them. Yeah, based on what we're saying, you're going to have to make the decision on the waiver priority because you just get so limited opportunity in a waiver priority system. That's why we say switch to FAB. Uh, let's start at the wide receiver position. Who are you targeting? Which players are ignorable for their kind of outlandish week one performances? Which ones are targets? So there's a handful of guys who are at least interesting uh, the the top ad for me is Cooper Cup. Uh, I know that people are probably like, well, Kenny Galladay is my top ad. And what I alluded to earlier was if you're interested in Kenny Galladay, and I, look, the smooth routes, I mean, he's impressive. He's good. But if you're interested in Kenny Galladay, you better be interested in Benny Fowler because he's the three on his team and he happened to score two touchdowns. I, 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 I like think people are surprised to hear you say that. I, I like Galladay moving forward, but he just... Is he the Fowler, though, as a rookie that could ascend to that wide receiver two spot? Fowler has no chance of taking over for Sanders or for... Right, and Demarius I don't think Thomas. Galladay is, has a chance to take over I, for I, Jones or Tate this I do year. think one problem with that analogy is that you've seen now for multiple years that with, uh, with Kansas City, they had thrown exclusively, basically, to those two wide receivers, barely using tight ends. Denver? Or, yes, sorry, Denver, um, and uh, you know, barely throwing to their tight ends, rarely using their third wide receiver. Whereas Matthew Stafford has always spread the ball around. You just had Anquan Bolden leave as a touchdown guy. And Tate's on the inside. 
Just, I think there's some. I, I'm just. I'm not trying to argue with. Yeah. I like it when you're not being reactionary, Mike. It's a very comforting thing. Well, here but, I am. But here I am trying to counterpoint here, where you have to take a shot. If you want to take a shot, what percentage of your fab would you spend? Would you spend five percent of your fab on Kenny um, Galladay? Oh yeah, yeah. I would gladly spend five to to ten percent. I mean, you're gonna probably have to be in the fifteen percent if you really want to secure him. But Cooper Cup is the is the guy that I would be targeting Washington, San Francisco, Dallas. I mean, that's that's three pretty solid matchups for a wide receiver. Meanwhile, Kenny Galladay, Giants, Falcons, Vikings. So Yeah, that's not – Cooper Cup is a guy you can you can put in your flex immediately, and I'm talking the probably, you know, at least 15% for Cooper Cup. Okay. If, you, if you're wanting to get a wide receiver. One player that I think – people were expecting to be brought up right away is is one of the leading wide receivers on the week Nelson Aguilar let's explain to people how they should react to Nelson Aguilar's big game six catches didn't do a lot beyond the big broken play however where if you watch that play Carson Wentz ran around for a half an hour lobbed it downfield he broke a tackle 58 yard touchdown the one thing I I will say in support of Nelson Aguilar is that he's looked good from training camp and then into preseason and now on in week one. Uh, this coming week they've got a matchup that I think kind of plays into his hand uh, uh, again because Marcus Peter w Peters will probably be more focused on Alshon Jeffrey, leaving Nelson Aguilar again open for uh, maybe th the the possibility of leading that team in receptions. So he's a guy I would be willing to spend 5% of my budget on. He was still a highly touted guy. I know uh, Matt Harmon uh, likes what he's seen. He's always been the butt of jokes, uh, you know. So, But to say that he can't have grown into being a good wide receiver, I think it is possible. I think we could be seeing a decent wide receiver there. And if Carson Wentz takes that step up right. to being a great quarterback – he could be, you know, a, a a flex option throughout the year. For those that want us to weigh in on kind of your favorite to step into Allen Robinson's shoes and be the highest producing fantasy wide receiver in Jacksonville, are you kind of putting your stock in Allen Hearns or are you doing it in Marcus Lee? Marquise <sighs> Lee, I mean. I would, I would pick up Hearns, which because I think that he has – an equal chance as Lee to be the high producer on the team. He's going to be cheaper. I think that Lee will be the, the, the target for people on the waiver wire. And Hearns says he's done it. And I know that that doesn't always mean moving forward that he will be the guy. But of anyone, I would put the, the cheap bid on Hearns. I'm, I'm not really interested in getting Lee on the team. These are – the one thing worth saying right now on the waiver – uh, situation is all these players are under 15% owned. Uh, Cooper Cup, Marquise Lee, they're about 15, 20%. Galladay's 8%. Hearn's 1%. Aguilar's down at 5%. There are other names to pay attention to. And one of the names I want to bring up, if you didn't, if he was undrafted in your league, John Brown, I think you need to pay attention to John Brown. Now, I, I had him on my bench. I, I just traded him. But I think that in the absence of David Johnson, there is a necessity for the offense, it's probably going to be more focused on the pass. This is Arians' offense. He's going to be frustrated if they can't move the ball on the ground. And they're going to put it in the arm of Carson Palmer. I think John Brown, when he's on the field, has every chance to be wide receiver two candidate. So I think if John Brown's available mm -hmm. in your league, he's somebody I'm looking at this week. Even I'm, I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, you know, Obviously, we're, we're close here in Arizona, but the John Brown versus J.J. Nelson debate that has gone on for a while and – you know, J.J. Nelson is such a tiny guy, just can't see it being consistent. But he was, he was, you know, he was involved, five receptions, caught the touchdown. Uh, you know, if, if John Brown is someone we need to keep an eye on, then maybe J.J. Nelson is as well. All right. Um, anybody else that you want to bring up? Jermaine Curse. Yeah. Jermaine Curse was worried. the leading wide receiver for the New York Jets, somebody to pay attention to. I think Josh Bellamy is, look, someone – for Chicago has to catch the ball, has to be the wide receiver one. I mean, someone has to catch the ball, but it's not necessarily a wide receiver. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that right now. <laughs> sure. All right, let's move on to the running backs. Tariq Cohen is going to be the hottest name on fantasy waiver wires this week. 12 targets out of the backfield, 8 for 47 and a touchdown, 5 for 66 on the ground. Tariq Cohen continues to impress. The game flow 
certainly conducive to Tariq Cohen this week, as was Kevin White's injury, the lack of weapons in the passing game. Does it continue? That's all we need to know. Because if it continues, what percentage of your fab dollars are you willing to invest early in the season on a Chicago scat back? Yeah, it continues. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't see a way that it doesn't because the game scripts are going to be negative more than they're going to be positive for and the even, Chicago Bears. Even when they were neutral. This was a neutral game script the entire week or the entire game. Cohen still had 12 targets. Yeah, and he's just looked so good. This isn't one game. This isn't where, okay, he came out and who's this guy at week one? I mean, you were calling him as a breakout, uh, you know, in the offseason based on what we saw in preseason every single time that that human being touches the ball. It feels the exact same as when Tyreek Hill touches the ball. I watch a guy that goes and does something that most other, you know, humans with the football can't do. So... I think he will be involved by necessity. And if he is touching the ball eight to 12 times a game, he'll have a, he'll have an opportunity to produce. Now I, I want to temper that with the fact that I don't think he will ever be the workhorse. I think that if Jordan Howard goes down, I don't think he's got the size, the body to just take over. So your ceiling here is not what you hope when you get that crazy running back waiver wire hit where you go, I mean, it's very common where a waiver wire guy, Jordan Howard last year, becomes a top five type of running back. I don't think that's happening for Tyreek Cohen. I think one of the things about Tyreek Cohen to pay attention to, too, and Mike brought up Darren Sproles, Tyreek Cohen is not small. Tyreek Cohen is short. And I want to make that point because he is very strong and he is built like a running back. He's a short running back. He is not a small running back. This is not Dexter McCluster we're talking about. Right. This is uh, it's not somebody, a J.J. Nelson. No, no. And so let me give you a scenario. Let's rubber meets the road. Mike, Jason, if you are a DJ owner or you're not a DJ owner, what is the percentage of fab you'll invest on Cohen in those two situations? If you need to get a player, here's the thing that I think David Johnson owners face. There are options that are very low ceiling options. Buck Allen is another one we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, I just made trade a uh, trade for Bilal Powell. You know, there are players, Thomas Rawls, that you can start. But if you're replacing DJ on your team, where DJ was drafted, you're looking to try to salvage your season with an upside player. How much would you invest in Cohen if you're a DJ owner, and how much would you invest if you're just uh, if you have running backs already? It, it uh, if I don't have in a percentage, if I don't have David Johnson. I'm looking 30 to 40 percent. I'm going to be very aggressive on getting Cohen on my team, especially with the Kevin White news. He's out there. I just feel like he is going to be so necessary for this team. And side note, if someone is panicking right now on Jordan Howard, I would gladly trade for Jordan Howard. They see what Cohen did. They, oh, Jordan Howard's not the not the workhorse I was expecting. I will gladly take. Jordan Howard on my team because he's the one touching them. He's the he is the banger. He is going to be still fine. Believe me, he's he's going to be fine. But Cohen, I'm going to be very aggressive, thirty to forty percent more than that. If I had David Johnson go down on my team, I want Cohen, and I'm going to pay the piper to get him on my roster. Well, you didn't answer the question though, D David Johnson. If you had David Johnson, what percentage of? Oh, so I said if I don't have him, thirty to forty and more. So. You know, I'm willing to go 50% on Cohen wow. if I don't Jason? have David Johnson. Yeah, I, I'm not getting Tyreek Cohen. Um, I, I think when I look at him, he's worth 20, 25% of my budget. Uh, but I'm always, I've always been, this is just a difference of style. I've been less aggressive in week one usually than, than uh, you two just from history in our own leagues. What about you, Andy? What, what, what would you be throwing? Uh, I'm facing that decision. That's why I wanted the cheat code. You guys didn't help me. I don't know how much to spend on Tariq Cohen. I feel like uh, you know how much I'm spending now. Yeah, it's just very yeah, difficult. Yeah, so he, there's the question. If if you think Mike is spending 45 of his $100 and you're going to go pick him up, are you going over that? I mean, this is Vegas. Over or under? What's Andy Holloway's putting his money on? Probably over. But I want to talk about Buck Allen. Javorius Allen, Baltimore Ravens, 21 carries last week. Did not catch a pass, but that will change quickly yes. with Danny Woodhead off the field. 
Uh, we don't know how long Danny Woodhead, unless you guys have any insight that I, I don't have. I expect months. It'll be a while because he was recovering from this injury and it looked like a problem carted off the field. Buck Allen might be a lot cheaper than Tariq Cohen. Should be a lot cheaper than Tariq Cohen. What percentage of your fab are you spending on him? Because he's available in 100% of leagues. I like Buck Allen quite a bit. Uh, he's going to be much cheaper. I think he's going to be just as valuable while Danny Woodhead is gone. The problem is he won't be a full season. He's he's more of a rental. So I'm willing to spend you know probably ten bucks on Buck Allen, and I and I'll get him for ten dollars. Maybe you I don't. I don't think you will. Depends who you're playing with. Yeah, that is true. Uh, if you're in a pickle, running backs don't they're they're hard to find. And there are a lot of people out there with a guy like Eddie Lacy. Maybe you thought you you had a player you could rotate in, and you probably don't. I guess when I look at it, you know, if 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 I, I would rather get for ten dollars, whichever guy slips to me between a Mike Tolbert, a Marlon Mack, a Javorius Allen, a sure. Terry Cohen, sure. than spend my fifty dollars to get one of those guys that I think has the best chance, but very well might not end up being the right guy of those four. So I'm going to put like ten dollar bids on everybody and and see what falls to me. Also with Tariq, uh, I think we we didn't say this at the beginning, but Benny Cunningham, the other Bears running back, he has a high ankle sprain. So Ooh. this, it's it's uh, it's Tariq Cohen, and who else is behind him? Tariq Cohen really could lead the team in receptions. Yeah, so I just, I'm, I'm being aggressive. I've been very impressed with everything I've seen. Now you're not just trying to drum up, you know, like, Raise. Char, char, raise the fab bids for the league. I would not do that to the right folk now. Plan. Um, okay, all right. But also, some know, other names. Marlon know Mack. your league. Know your league for when you put in your bids. I mean, we're just we're saying what we would bid in our leagues. But if you have cheap skates like Jason over here is like, I'm going to get Tariq Cohen for five dollars. No, I mean, then I said twenty five. Then adjust your. Then put twenty six dollars on Tariq Cohen. Yeah, I, Marlon Mack is the name that I I think we is necessary to bring up before we move on because he looked very good. He was involved. While Andrew Luck is not in, I don't think that goal they're, line. I just was impressed with his goal line utilization. I, and and I don't think they're going to give Frank Gore this two hundred and fifty carry workload when when Andrew Luck's not there. You know, they they're just they're not going to wear him out in a loss. And so Marlon Mack had two touchdowns this week too. Although Chuck Pagano one took touchdown. one of those. One touchdown. Chuck Pagano yes. took one of his two touchdowns away because, like an idiot, he didn't challenge the play where he got in. And he's like, oh, we're going to sneak we're gonna sneak well, ahead. To be fair, the, the San Francisco 49ers defense that he was playing was very tough. Yeah, yeah what funny. Mike's referencing is the fact that Chuck Pagano, after the defeat, uh, gave a lot of credit to Sean McVay and the 49ers. Yeah. Well, Sean McVay. How was that even happening? Hey, half right. <laughs> <laughs> right? He was playing against Sean McVay. So. Ten carries for Marlon Mack. Did have the touchdown. Had one reception. I think you could see him involved more often. This is another situation where if you have Jacoby Brissett or Tolzien starting, you need the check down. And Mack represents some upside there. I think Turbin is a drop based really? on this week. I do. I, I, I would agree with that. One I mean, carry for the entire game. You just If you were betting on, hey, maybe Turbin's the work share guy it's not happening yeah the, the best case scenario was that he's your goal line guy how many goal line opportunities are these Colts getting right now you what, can drop them what percentage would you put on Kerwin Williams versus Chris Johnson versus Andre Ellington versus a bag of uh, baloney two carries for Turbin by the way oh thanks Mike <laughs> now you <laughs> well, made I just, your, just wanted it to be correct how in the world could you say drop Eddie Lacy and not say Robert Turbin drop Robert Turbin no I'm not saying he's not a drop I just was uh getting the correct stuff. I I think Chris Johnson is where I would make my play personally, even um, though he's not on the team yet. Yeah, I, I, I think that they'll sign Chris Johnson, and if if he's not on the team by the time the waivers go through, then I will one hundred percent be putting a zero dollar bid on Chris Johnson in every league because it won't cost you anything. People aren't going to bid on him, and you could just steal the the starting running back for free, possibly. Mike Tolbert, twelve carries, forty two yards, one touchdown, had a pass catch. Mike, you're a shady owner, right? Are you bidding on him? Uh, if I am, it's not very, very much at all. And the we've we've talked about on the show. We don't handcuffs are, are a tricky situation because one, you you're never quite positive who it's going to be, but sometimes you are. In and it looks like right now, Mike Tolbert would be the guy. 
if Shady were to go down. And let's be honest, if LaShawn McCoy is going to continue to touch the ball, what, 30 times a game or whatever it is, you might want to have the, yeah. <laughs> some insurance on your bench because they're going to wear him out. All right. Let, anybody else you want to talk about at the running back position? Before? I mean, Chris Carson is is worth a uh, yeah. I mean, if, if you think if you think Thomas Rawls is worth it and Eddie Lacy is worth dropping, then yeah, that's it could be well. And also, I mean, Rawls is already hurt again. He has problems with his ankles, so it's Chris Carson's worth just stashing on the bench. All right, we're going to talk tight ends right now, and then we're going to get into the quarterback streams of the week, players that you can sign quarterbacks you can sign off the waiver wire and start this week at the tight end position you saw big weeks from Charles Clay four for 53 and a touchdown Austin Hooper had the monstrous reception but was two for 128 on two targets and a touchdown but only two targets you also had the situation with Hunter Henry are you dropping Hunter Henry I feel like you are stuck dropping Hunter Henry now because he was not on the field I turned this game uh I turned the game on and I never saw Hunter Henry and to be fair uh, you don't have to drop Hunter Henry. I think it, what they did was possibly just week one. This is their offensive plan. Hunter Henry is a good blocker, and that's what they had him doing uh, as they tried to rush for two yards of carry. And then once they switched to a pass team, I mean, they went three wide. They weren't doing a two tight end set. This was 11 personnel, and Antonio Gates was the designated pass catching tight end. So moving forward, Henry could be more involved. But I'm not having it. I was I was hurt too much I'd this weekend him. by Hunter Henry, so I'm moving on to someone else, probably I, Clay I, or even – we didn't mention him yet, but Zach Miller, uh, I think he's worth an add as well with, uh, with the Chicago pass catching situation being in turmoil. Jason, how would you prioritize these free agent tight ends? Charles Clay, Austin Hooper, George Kittle, Zach Miller, and let's throw Jared Cook in there. Mm-hmm. He was mm-hmm. he was only five for fifty six, but he was still more involved. I'll than, take five for fifty. Then we were expected eight fantasy points. I uh, think Clay's the leader, right? Clay is the leader. If I want a guy that I think is going to be valuable for the next ten weeks running, you yeah. know, I, I I like Clay. He was near my top twelve tight ends pre draft, so I believe that you're going to see a lot more of this on Clay. So he'd be my number one there. But when I pick up a tight end. I'm not looking usually even two weeks in. I'm fine dropping. You know, we I, I drafted Martellus Bennett. I'll probably drop Martellus Bennett and grab someone else. And if I pick up Martellus Bennett later in the year, whatever. I don't I don't really care about dropping tight ends. Let people pick up their two or three tight ends if they if they want. That's why I'm fine dropping Hooper. So uh, with all that said, the two guys that I would probably be targeting would be Zach Miller and Jared Cook. Jared Cook against the New York Jets. I think that that defense, uh, you know, we, that they were susceptible um, this last week to the tight end. Uh, I think he's a good play. And Zach Miller, because of the loss of Kevin White, he's going to be involved. So you're basically saying Clay is your one season-long pickup from this group. The rest are streaming options. Right. Okay. Defensive streaming options this week absolutely love, love yes. the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah, everyone else is going to love them too, but they're the, the top pickup. Baltimore Ravens versus the Browns. Oh, oh, wait. I'm, I'm sorry. We left someone off of this list. Did we? Yeah, we did. Who? Kobe! Oh! <laughs> Kobe Fleener. <laughs> yeah, you can say it's garbage time. That's fine. But my bold prediction that he will be a top five tight end. Looking so good. far, he's the number I four tight end. I think that I'm going to lean in here, and I'm just going to... Brooks, every week I want to do a top five Kobe Fleener check. <laughs> week one in the books, Jason... It's right. thumbs up for Jason and Kobe Fleener. Yeah, uh, look, I, I uh, he no, got a it's touchdown. A question. Willie Sneed is out, and that was against a really good defense that was bottling Drew Brees the whole game. He had five receptions. He was involved. He was on routes. He was used downfield. So Kobe Fleener is actually a guy I would legitimately. Kobe you know Fleener. I, I would I would pick him up. Takes on New England this week. Five for fifty four and a touchdown last week. Owned in sixteen percent of leagues. Fleener or Cook, Mike? Who? Oh man, problem. I'm gonna take Cook. I would as well, just for the record. The Ravens take on the Browns. It's a juicy matchup. They just shut out the Bengals. Juice. And you get Deshaun Kaiser, who I read. Yeah, I think he took seven sacks, and that that number could be wrong, but I believe none of them happened within the first four seconds of a play. 
like I said, he held onto the ball for he thought it was college and he can get away with some things and and always, hopefully he learns. I see it's so Reggie Bush did that his first year I mean, in the league. It's, look, it's, and Christian McCaffrey, you used to be able to toy with people in college. You could make you could, you didn't have to get downfield as quick. You didn't have to go downhill. You could play around. You can't do that in the NFL. The players are too fast. And I get it. I mean, th- this is what you're used to. So you would think, well, I got to, you know, th- you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself if you're going to be an NFL player. And a lot of rookies come in overconfident and hopefully he adjusts. But Raven, the Ravens are a great play. The Rams, if you have them, I'm going to keep playing them. Are you? Yeah. I was curious about that. I They had a humongous week last week, but they do go to Washington – I believe. Yeah, and, I'll still um, play him. Son, son of, of bum. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. play the, it, the They're, they're at home, bummers. actually. They're at home against Washington. Uh, and they might have Aaron Donald back. They will have yes. Aaron Donald back. So, that's I mean, been that's, confirmed. That's a huge upgrade for a, a D that looked great. And the Raiders take on the Jets. Great stream. So there, there are options out there. Man, I love the Ravens. I really do. I, I just think their defense is one of the best in the league right now. And then playing against the Browns is – Always delightful. Yeah, they, they did everything you want. They had sacks against Dalton, and then they caused turnovers. So, got to love it. Full stream ahead. Hey, Brooks, guess what? What's that? I'm eating whatever I want this week. Oh, yeah? Hey. You know who's not? These two guys. These guys. Uh, we had two. Head-to-head-to-head competitions this week in Playdraft uh, on playdraft.com slash ballers. And I defeated uh, all, all, t- all two of you in one of them. And then Mike this, won the other I mean, this is erroneous because I won. Yeah, you won one of one. them. Yeah, you did. So each of you. I feel like I should balance out. Nope. No, no, no. This week there will only be one, so there will only be one loser yeah. this week. So you guys will have to fight over that. And then uh, we'll go out to lunch this week, and I'll go ahead and pick a lunch for – well, Mike, you get to pick one of them, and I'll pick one for uh, you. That's fine because you're going out soaking wet because <laughs> Stephon Diggs versus Adam Thielen was a victory, and Keenan Allen versus Pierre Garçon was a victory. Wait, Allen caught another pass? Yeah. yeah. Dang it. I See, I'm fine losing those water bets, though, because Thielen was incredible and Garçon was great. Yes. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm soaking wet, and Jason's soaking wet because I won the bet. Barely. Hilton. Moncrief. <laughs> <laughs> that was a barn burner. <laughs> Hilton was three for 57. Moncrief caught one pass for, for 50, 50 yards. So, yeah, I think you cheated, Mike. Touchdown shouldn't count. But because uh, what? Allen had a touchdown and Diggs had two. That's right. And Garcon and Thielen outperformed in yards where it really matters. So <laughs> I guess if. Uh, all all right. right. Hey, full stream ahead. We're looking at quarterback streams of the week. Maybe one of you guys should kind of outline how we do this segment each and every week, what it means, what it represents, the history of it. Yeah, so take us e- back. So every single week, what we do is we take a look at we go by ESPN's public, you know, uh, stats, and we say what quarterbacks are available in more than half the leagues. So they're on the waivers in your average league, and we're gonna pick one of them to start this week because so many people have to, you know, play off the waivers and it's a really good method to actually win playing matchups at the quarterback position that are predictable usually breeds success we uh we tracked this two years ago and our our frankenstein quarterback off of waivers would have averaged the quarterback six which is really good uh happy with that now all of that said this week it's tough this week oh man this was one of the hardest weeks in the last three years that i can remember I don't love the streaming options, but we're still coming through with good stuff. I can uh, kick it off if you want. Since sure. We've already talked. It's funny l- that you two pick guys that I think they both had monster week ones last year. Yeah, maybe. Uh, that's impossible because Jason's pick did not play week one. Oh, thank you very much. That's right. He sat down because he just arrived to his team, and that's Sammy Biscuits, Mr. Sam Bradford himself. I am buying into the level up. I look, I don't love the matchup against Pittsburgh, but in the off season, Sam Bradford was one of those guys that I, I really took a, a serious look at whether or not he could do a Matt Ryan style 
upgrade in the touchdown department because he's got it everywhere else. His accuracy is there. His yards are there. Mm -hmm. Even though he's not a high-volume pass uh, game, they want to run. They want to be defensive. If he could just fix the touchdowns, he'd be very valuable for fantasy. Well, yesterday when they got both both you know the deep shots to the end zone and when they got down around the goal line, the play calling was nice, the design was nice, and Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs are legit. I think Dalvin Cook is going to open up the lanes, and the most important factor for me when I'm just looking about the eyeball test was the offensive line. Sam Bradford has spent the majority of his career throwing the ball while getting crushed, and he actually had time to look down the field and make a good throw. I, I think he is a good quarterback. Deshaun Kaiser put up an okay week against Pittsburgh, so... You could do worse. He only had an 84% completion percentage. Last <laughs> right. <laughs> He's going to break his own record. What's funny is if you look at last year for Bradford, and I was wrong, it was the second week in which he had a very good performance. Yeah. He ended the year last year with two three-touchdown games, the only three-touchdown games of the entire year for him. And he comes out and has a three-touchdown game in his first week. If these trends continue. It's pretty nice. I mean, he, he, he far surpassed his highest passer rating of the season. La uh, in his first game this year than he had all of last year. So you can't argue with 27 for 32, and you can't argue with the impact that Dalvin Cook yes, had. Yes, Dalvin Cook makes a huge difference for this team. They had zero running game last year. I don't even want to say mine out loud, but I, I do <laughs> oh, believe, do I do believe in it. it no, Everyone, I don't want to save it. it look, Carson Palmer against Indianapolis this week without David Johnson, I think you can do worse. It's gonna, I, everything I said earlier, I, I think, I believe, which is Arians is going to put the ball in the hands of the people he trusts the most, and David Johnson's not an option anymore. Indianapolis looked atrocious last week. Jared Goff uh, had a great game against them, and it's scary because the options are not spectacular this week. So I think in the streaming world, Carson Palmer will bounce back. I think last week was a bad performance, but I'm not going to let that – completely uh, indoctrinate me. So I, I'm going to go with Carson Palmer as a streaming option against Indianapolis and double down on him. I still like the early season schedule for him. So I, I think he can get it in the end zone two times. Is Vontae Davis gone or is he that's, back for – That's a question. That, that, would, that, that, that would make the difference for me. If he's yeah. still gone, then I think, uh, sure, Carson, okay. If he's back, that's much scarier. Obviously, Jared Goff didn't have to deal with that. And I would, uh, I would just say this on the bright side: you know he'll be there on waivers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, he will. If he's not, he will be shortly. There's, there are the the trouble with with this week for the stream is there's a there's a handful of guys where you're like, oh, this is okay, but no one is standing out. So you're, and I'm actually going to pivot because of that. Hmm. That there's no one to stand out. So I'm going to take. Tyrod Taylor. Oh, yeah. I know that he has, he's going on the road against Carolina, but I'm not really scared of Carolina's defense. And Tyrod Taylor's just, week after week after week, the guy is a top 12 quarterback. He gives you that rushing baseline. And so I'm – I almost went Tyrod. I think Shady, that's a good pick. I mean, Shady's a stud. You, you have to worry about him. So Tyrod Taylor is widely available, and I would pick him up in – I just want – just for, for people to realize, you know, like Joe Flacco against the Browns. I was going to go Alex Smith against Philadelphia. So there are some – there's options out there. Smith is passable. Yeah, exactly. He's passable, but so I'm going to go because everyone's just kind of passable. I mean, Goff versus Washington, passable. Because of that, I'm going to go with the upside play of Tyrod Taylor. Kareem Hunt helps Alex Smith the same way Dalvin Cook helps Sam Bradford. Certainly. All right, I think we're going to do a couple mailbag questions before Ooh. we close out the show. Bag. Bag, oh bag. Yeah. All right, we'll answer some more questions tomorrow for sure, but we wanted to hop on and answer some Foot Clan questions on the show today. If you have a question, go to the website, thefantasyfootballers.com. Click the Submit a Question button. We also have a voicemail hotline. You can leave your question on there, 302-464-TFFB. Keep those questions nice and tight. Tight to the point, just, and we can get them on the show. tighten them up. Jesse in Alberta, Canada. Oh, bonjour. Bonjour. Would you drop Jeremy Hill or Deonta Foreman for Tariq Cohen? Ye yeah. I Hill. would, but I would much rather drop Deonta Foreman than... Even with the news that the hype, the hype news coming out this week, he's going to get more carries, Jason. Should we even have mentioned Deonta Freeman on uh, 
Deontay Foreman? Not for yes, De- Deontay <laughs> For- Foreman on the waiver pickups. Well, we've mentioned him now. I I I would drop him for Tyreek. I would take I, a flyer on Foreman. Would you rather have a flyer? Would you rather have Foreman on your bench or P Ryan right now? Oh man, Foreman. P Ryan. Yeah. What? Where do you land on that? I think on the P Ryan side. Yeah. Um, Murray for Dez question from Sutton in Texas. In my half point PPR league, I was offered Dez Bryant for Demarco Murray. I would not do that trade. That is my official response. Well, you have to look at his roster. So he has DT, Alshon, and Devontae Parker, and his other running back is LaShawn McCoy. I would not do that trade. Yeah. <laughs> that is my yeah, official response. Yeah, I don't think I would. It, I said go get Des Bryant, but I'm not going to trade no. DeMarco Murray. I mean, it was a bad game fantasy-wise for Murray, but he was still the primary guy. I mean, he, uh, he out-touched Derrick Henry by a wide margin. They're still going with DeMarco Murray as the main running back. All right, this question from McLovin in Ottawa, Canada. Oh, oh bonjour. <laughs> hey, ball, hey, boys. I play in a two-quarterback league, and my quarterbacks are Russell Wilson and Andy Dalton. Wow, that's a rough week one. I was wondering if you guys think I should drop Andy. No. For week two because of the tough matchup and pick up Sammy Biscuits. No, though. you should absolutely pick up Sam Sammy Biscuits. Why is he on the wire in a two quarterback? Yeah, league? if this is a two quarterback, I'd find league. a way to have all three of those guys. Yeah, absolutely league. have all three of those guys. If you're in a two quarterback league, M- must do, must do, must do. must do. All right, that is it for today's show. We'll be back tomorrow answering questions. Uh, maybe do a little keep trade cut. And uh, walk you into week two. Excited to see maybe those touchdown means come back to normal. You know, the touchdown totals come back to the mean. That's what I meant to say, not the you means. You got there. And, uh, look, don't forget, playdraft.com slash ballers. If you're interested in playing some DFS with us, we'll have a live draft on Friday. And you can check out jointhefoot.com to be a part of our fantasy football community. For Andy, Mike, and Jason, I say farewell. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.